really the, the founding force of Fort Collins uh, Bible College. He has been a faithful friend and, and has risen to the, uh, to the office of elder in this very church. And it is such a delight every time I get to hear him teach because he's such a, a careful uh, student of God's word, reverent and, um, and intentionally moving through every text that he looks at. I just, I always jump at the chance to get to hear Ben teach. And so if you would please uh, give a warm round of applause for Ben as he comes up to talk about the strategy of Satan. Good morning, everyone. As Brad said, my name is Ben. I want to reiterate with Sam what a, an honor it is to, to be here and be able to share with you this morning. And I hope and pray that it's encouraging and edifying for you and that it gives um, all of us something practical to take from God's Word and, and begin to apply to our lives. I want to mention that I tried to give you a fairly detailed um, note page in there. So if you're one who learns best by taking notes, by all means do that. But I tried to give you enough that if you would prefer to just sit back and listen and watch, you'll be able to do that. We're going to have to go pretty quick to get through this in the, the time allotted to us this morning. So I wanted to, to give you that option. Second, um, lest I forget, the starting point for this message that I have for you was a book by Warren Wearsby called The Strategy of Satan. And I'm going to be using a chart that uh, I got from him. I, I made some changes, but if you've not read that and you want to go deeper into what I talk about this morning, I highly recommend The Strategy of Satan by Warren Wearsby. It's a nice, relatively brief read that I think would be beneficial for you. Let's get started in a word of prayer. <clears throat> God, thank you so much for this morning, the time that we have to gather together as, as believers and fellowship around your word. God, thank you so much for choosing to communicate with us so clearly, God, giving us meaning that we can understand. I just ask that you would overcome any weaknesses in me this morning in my, my speaking and um, come through clearly, Lord, help us all to understand your word and in a way that, that we'll be able to apply going forward from here. Thank you so much again, Lord, for uh, sending your son to, to die for us so that we can come from a, a point of victory in this and for giving us um, the ending of the story in, in the book of Revelation and elsewhere in Scripture so that we could know that uh, we are on the, the winning side. Thank you so much again. God, may you be glorified through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. During the World War II era, radio was by far the best way to communicate quickly over long distances. The problem was it was relatively easy to intercept radio messages. So in a war context, you don't want to send messages via radio that aren't encrypted because then everybody knows what you're saying to one another. To try to get around this, the Germans developed this Enigma machine, which they believed to be absolutely unbreakable. For, and, and for a long time it was, but the Allied powers put quite a bit of effort toward decrypting the Enigma machine. And at Bletchley Park in Great Britain, a, an Allied team of mathematicians developed a machine and a method by which finally they broke the code, the Enigma machine. And the Germans didn't know that, most importantly. So now, Germans are sending these uh, encrypted messages, which the Allied forces are able to understand, and the Germans don't know that the Allied forces know what they're saying to one another. So obviously, knowing what the enemy was communicating, knowing their strategy, knowing their plans, was hugely beneficial to the Allied forces, and that proved to be uh, significant in the war effort. And the same is true in this present spiritual war. Knowing the strategy of the enemy is hugely beneficial for us in, in this uh, spiritual war. And while we don't have any way to know the future, 
concerning exactly how Satan and his demons are going to attack us. We have the word of God that we can turn to. We can see how Satan has attacked in the past and be confident that he's going to continue to attack in, in, in those methods. We can learn from his strategy as we look to the word of God. Sam spoke of Satan's core motivation, his core purpose of rebellion against God. Now we're going to turn our attention to how he acts in seeking to oppose God, specifically as it relates to us. 2 Corinthians 2 says, For indeed what I have forgiven, I did so for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. The dictionary defines a scheme as a plan or program of action. Your translation might include the word wiles. Great word. <laughs> Encourage you to use that more. <laughs> wiles, devices, designs, and another synonym is strategy. See, Satan is not like the child who is going along with what their parents say, saying, I'm doing what you want, but inwardly I'm rebelling. That's not Satan. Neither is Satan like the child who is throwing a temper tantrum in the corner, but passively going to do nothing else about it. Satan is a schemer. He's a plotter. He's crafty. He's very sophisticated in how he's seeking to go about opposing God. He's not the tam temper tantrum throwing kid in the corner. He's actively seeking to develop and implement a plan to oppose God, and he's going to seek to bring us along with him as much as he can. His purpose, as it pertains to us, is to get us to join him in opposing God's will. Satan's strategy is to launch four major attacks to get us to join him in opposing God's will. I want to note that I'm not trying to offer a comprehensive survey this morning of every way that Satan attacks. I'm looking specifically at um, what's relevant for us. A, a few other ways that we know Satan attacks and his demons, possession, but that can't be true of us as believers. And if you're dealing with someone um, who may be involved in some of those demonic things, the best thing that we can do is, is prayer and sharing the gospel with them because we know if they place their faith in Christ, that won't be a problem for them anymore. We know that Satan launches national attacks on Israel. In, in Scripture, we see in the book of Esther, an example, with Haman. We see in more modern history, events such as the Holocaust and all the way down to modern anti-Semitism. Israel is God's chosen people. Of course, Satan's going to oppose and seek to destroy God's chosen people. And then we see also that Satan is involved in blinding the minds of unbelievers, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4. 4. He's seeking to prevent people from understanding the truth. In, in the parables we've seen in Matthew, Satan has been the one coming to try to pick up the seed before it can take root in a person's heart. So these are some other ways that Satan attacks, but this morning we're going to look specifically at things more relevant for us. I also want to reiterate that Satan is not omnipresent. He's not outside of time like God is. So he can only be in one place at one time. That said, it's probably unlikely that any of us will be personally attacked by Satan. So when I say Satan this morning, please understand that I mean Satan and his demons, and as it pertains directly to us personally, probably just demons. Um, but we can assume that they're all aligned in their purpose, in their strategy. Wanted to make that note. And then another note is there's a difficult balance when we talk about Satan and his demons and this spiritual war. Because on one hand, we're operating from a place of victory. Praise God, we know the end of the story. We know that we've won, that God has won more specifically, and that in our alignment with him, we have authority. But we also know that we face a very powerful, sophisticated adversary that we should not take lightly. I crunched the numbers earlier this morning and figured out that I've been around for less than 1% of human history. <laughs> Satan's been around for all of it. 
And while uh, he's not eternal or self-existent, he's been around from the beginning. He's had a lot of time to fine-tune his, his craft, and we have not. So there's an important balance there, resting in the authority and victory of Christ. But as 1 Peter 5.8 says, being sober-minded, t- taking it seriously, being on the alert, keeping um, this in, in consideration. So again, Satan's strategy is to launch four major attacks to get us to join him in opposing God's will. We're going to fill out this chart. You've got it filled out already for you in your notes. Don't look ahead. (laughs) A a lot of titles are used of God in Scripture, and these titles tell us of his attributes, of his character. Similarly, certain titles are used of Satan that can tell us more about his character. We're going to see in these four biblical examples, these four attacks that Satan makes on people, that he's using a particular weapon aimed at a particular target for a specific purpose. And praise God, we're also going to see that we have a defense. And we're going to see what that is. And I tried to to give you all of that scripture in your uh, handout so that as we go forth from here, we can have a field manual in this spiritual war. So let's launch into the first attack. We see that Satan is called the deceiver. John 8, 44, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. God is truth. He accomplishes his will through truth. Of course, in Satan's opposition of God, he would seek to counter that truth. His attack on Eve, the account uh, that we're going to look at this morning, we're perhaps most familiar with in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We're going to break that down a little bit, but first let's see. The target that Satan is going for here is the mind. Paul puts it very well in 2 Corinthians 11 when he says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Just wanted to make sure we could see the yellow up there. Thoughts, I'm trying to highlight. Paul is equating um, that temptation of Eve in the garden with her thoughts being led astray. That's Satan's target. He wants to take our mind, our thinking And his weapon for doing so is lies. Looking at the attack on Eve again in Genesis 3, we see a threefold attack from Satan. First, he questions God's word. He seeks to get Eve to question God's word. Did God actually say? Satan's saying, are you sure that's what he meant? I I don't know if you're really solid on that. That's not what he meant. Did God actually say? First, he questions God's word. Second, He outright denies God's word. In verse 4, you will not surely die. Well, that's outright contradiction of what God had said. Satan begins with questioning his word, then he denies his word, and lastly, he substitutes his own lie as though it were the truth, saying in verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan's threefold attempt at deceiving Eve. He's a great deceiver. He's subtle, as Dr. Wood had mentioned last night. If I went to a grocery store and I wrote $100 on the back of this 8.5 by 11 piece of paper, tried to submit that for payment, I don't think it would be accepted. The most obviously wrong uh, counterfeits never work. Instead, 
as the, uh, the common illustration goes, the best counterfeits are the ones that are most like the original. And Satan knows that. And he's crafty. He's not going to come right out with the most blatant, obvious lies that are going to be so easily detected by us. He's going to inch away with subtlety, seeking to introduce these lies, these doubts concerning God's word, and work, chip away at that over time. His weapon is lies, his target is the mind, and his purpose is to make us ignorant of God's will. In the Genesis account, of course, we know that Eve and then Adam took of the fruit. They disobeyed God. They acted contrary to God's will because Satan succeeded in making them ignorant of God's will. But think, oh, before we get to our defense, want to look personally. What makes us ignorant of God's will today? Of course, external influences do. The movies, TV, music, news, books, unbelievers themselves that we're exposed to are providing inputs that we're taking in that have an influence on us. So, of course, those external forces can make us ignorant of God's will. But not only that. In C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, senior demon Screwtape is writing to his demon nephew, his nephew who is a demon, not a... (laughs) His his, uh, nephew, Wormwood, on how to steer the patient, a person, away from following God at all costs. And Screwtape says, It's funny how mortals always picture us as putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. So yes, of course, those external influences can make us ignorant of God's will. But in reality, distractions or anything that limits our perspective to only considering things of the world will do the same. Even if we limit all of those external influences, if we're not taking in the word of God actively, we're still going to be ignorant of God's will. And also, inappropriately relating to God and his word by trying to get him to align with our will rather than us aligning with his. Treating God like a vending machine whose purpose is to satisfy our will will also make us ignorant of his will. Our defense is, of course, the word of God. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So first we need to know the word of God. Psalm 1, 2, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. When scripture uses the word meditates, we're not talking about emptying our minds in in an Eastern sense of meditation. We're talking about actually filling our minds, but with the word of God. First, we read scripture, and then we ponder it. We think about it and its implications and its meanings and how we can apply it. That's what's meant by meditation. So we know the word of God. We meditate on the word of God. Joshua 1.8 says, similarly, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Psalm 119, 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We need to know the word of God, to meditate on it, to memorize it. One of my professors used to say that scripture memorization is the fuel of meditation. And that's very true. As we memorize God's word, it's there for us to think about throughout the day. It's there for us when a situation arises in which we can use the word of God, it's there already. We see that that Christ had memorized scripture, and in Matthew 4, 1 through 7, we'll see how Christ responds to Satan's attack with lies. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city 
and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. It is enough for Jesus to simply quote the word of God, to give the truth in response to Satan's lies and temptations that thwarts him. I want to note also the uh, seriousness with which we should notice that Satan knows the word of God too. He even quotes the word of God to God. He misuses it, of course, and Jesus corrects him. But uh, I, I wanted to, to note that as well. The importance of, of knowing the word of God, meditating on it, memorizing it, and then using it. Scripture is not meant to be merely academic for us, but put to use in our lives. We can effectively counter Satan's lies by knowing and applying the word of God. Let's move to our next attack. Satan is called in scripture the destroyer. Revelation 9:11, they have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he has the name Apollyon, meaning destruction and destroyer. 1 Peter 5:8 be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We don't need to be confused at all about Satan's intentions. He wants to destroy. The attack on Job we'll see in, in chapters 1 and 2 of the book of Job. Then Satan answered the Lord. This is in the, the council room of, of, of God. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But reach out with your hand now and touch all that he has. He will certainly curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not reach out and put your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of of the Lord. So we note that in order for Satan to oppress Job in this way, he needs permission from God. That is um, important to recognize. And we note also that God gave him permission. And that's a question that we expect to be answered by the book of Job, and it never is. And oftentimes in our lives, we uh, won't know the answers either. And in the, the remainder of chapter 1, we see that Job's children and servants were killed and that his livestock were killed, his camels taken. He lost his children, his servants, a large portion of his wealth, but was not personally afflicted yet because God limited that. But then Satan goes back to God. And in chapter 2, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, reach out with your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power. Only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with severe boils from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. Satan's target in, in this attack was the body of Job, his weapon, suffering. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with severe boils from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians, To keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. We see that God's purpose in allowing that thorn was to keep Paul from exalting himself. Satan's purpose was to torment Paul. And what is his purpose? To make us impatient with God's 
will. Notice Job's initial response to the suffering. He responds well. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold firm your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You are speaking as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we actually accept good from God, but not accept adversity? Despite all this, Job did not sin with his lips. This is in chapter 2, right after Satan originally comes and afflicts him. He responds very, very well initially. However, later on, after going through somewhat of an emotional roller coaster ride and some interesting conversations with his friends, he says, I will say to God, Do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend with me. Is it right for you indeed to oppress? to reject the work of your hands and to look favorably on the plan of the wicked? Why then did you bring me out of the womb? If only I had died and no eye had seen me, withdraw from me so that I may have a little cheerfulness. Job's not doing as well anymore. The point that he came to was first questioning God's plan. Is it right for you indeed to oppress. He'd gone from trusting God as the one who gives good but also gives adversity, allows adversity, to saying, is it right for you indeed to oppress? Then he rejects God's plan, saying that it would have been better for me never to have been born than for this to be happening now. Your plan is worse than me never existing. That's what Job is implying when he says, why then did you bring me out of the womb? If only I had died and no eye had seen me. He rejects God's plan. And then he seeks to escape God's plan in favor of his own. Withdraw from me so that I may have a little cheerfulness. God, go away. I don't want your plan. I want cheerfulness. That's my plan for me. Let me have that instead. He was impatient with God's will. And anytime Satan is bringing suffering and his demons are bringing suffering, that is the purpose. And of course, we know that not all suffering, pain, is a result of spiritual warfare. However, I think our response can always be the same when we're suffering, when we're in pain. Because we're not in Job's shoes, we tend to give him a really hard time for this, and especially his wife. But we unfortunately do the same thing. Whenever we're suffering, or in America today, even mildly uncomfortable, we are quick to question God's goodness. We're quick to question his plan for us, why he's allowing the pain. Unfortunately, we too get to the point of accusing God of mismanagement and seek to escape from his plan or at least lessen the pain if we can't escape it outright. God, on the other hand, seeks to use suffering and pain to cultivate patience and growth in us. Our defense is the imparted grace of God. He welcomes our weakness and honesty, but we would do well to trust him and run to his word rather than rejecting his plan and seeking to escape it. His grace is his bountiful provision for all that we need. God has given us all that we need. So we can't say in suffering, God, you are mismanaging. You have not provided for my needs. He has provided above and beyond what we deserve. James 1, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Notice what Job said later on. He's now at another high point in the emotional roller coaster. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. An allusion to the way that gold is refined. 1 Peter 5, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. May we say, like Job did, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. Concerning Paul's thorn in in the flesh, in his flesh, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Famous passage. 
For my power is made perfect in weakness, because we can't rely on ourselves. 1 Peter 4, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. We can effectively counter Satan's physical attacks by resting in the grace of God, his bountiful provision for all that we need, and trusting that his plan is best, rather than seeking to escape the pain, avoid the pain. Moving on to the next attack in Scripture, we see that Satan is called the ruler. John 14, I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. He's also called the evil one. Satan's attack on David from 1 Chronicles 21, then Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to count Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go, count Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring me word so that I may know their number. Now God was displeased with this thing, so he struck Israel. David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this thing, but now please overlook your servant's guilt, for I have behaved very foolishly. In this attack, Satan's target was the will and his weapon was pride. Sam made it very clear that Satan's core attribute is pride, which led him to oppose God. Of course, he's going to seek to incite pride in us, to get us to live independently of God as well. The attack in, in 1 Chronicles, Satan incited David to count Israel. There wasn't anything inherently wrong with conducting a census, but we see the motivation that David had. Go count Israel and bring me word so that I may know their number. And we know that this was wrong because God was displeased with it and David recognizes that it was wrong um, in verses 7 and 8. So this prideful motivation to know their number, to be able to rest in his human strength, his natural strength, rather than trusting in God, that was the problem with what David did here, with what Satan got David to do here. Whenever we assume that we're fine on our own, or even subconsciously go through life without acknowledging God, we're living independently of his will. And that's exactly what Satan wants. He wants to make us live independent of God's will. Another example, 2 Corinthians 26, of King Uzziah. His fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. But when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly, and he was untrue to the Lord his God. That's exactly what Satan wants. He wants us to be so proud that we are untrue to the Lord our God. So what is our defense to such attacks? The Holy Spirit of God, the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Ephesians five eighteen. And do not get drunk with wine in which there is debauchery, but be filled with with the Spirit, the idea of control, of influence by the Holy Spirit of God. Galatians 5, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Romans 8, for those who are in accord with the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are in accord with the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is is life and peace. As we depend on God, as we walk by means of the Spirit, He wills in us. He produces the fruit of the Spirit in us. If Satan's goal is to separate us from depending on Him, getting us to trust in ourselves instead, we must cling ever more tightly to Him. And how can we do that? 
we can effectively counter Satan's attempts to breed self-reliance in us by continually submitting to the Holy Spirit of God. Continual yieldedness, keeping short accounts with God, walking with him on a daily basis. And I would also posit that prayer is a recognition of dependence on God. There's our third attack. We'll move into our fourth attack on Joshua. I'll note right off the bat, this is not Joshua, the successor of Moses, who led Israel in the conquest. This is a different Joshua. This is Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, Jehozadak, the high priest who returned with Zerubbabel from the Babylonian captivity. So this is post-exilic, not Joshua, the successor of Moses. Okay. Satan is called the accuser. In fact, that's what that word means. Revelation 12, uh, 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Satan, or Satan, in Hebrew means adversary. And when the definite article ha, ha Satan, precedes Satan, it is sometimes translated the accuser. Satan is called the accuser. Satan's attack on Joshua comes in Zechariah 3, 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right to accuse him. I'm going to explain the context a little bit. First, what is Satan's target? What is his weapon? His target is the heart, the conscience of man. And his weapon is accusation. Satan here is accusing Joshua, the high priest. His purpose is to make us feel ashamed of God's will. To accuse is to charge with a fault or offense, to incriminate. Satan wants to trap us in hopelessness and helplessness, to use our guilt and shame to bring us to the point of despair. He wants us to feel like we've blown it too badly and just give up altogether. When Satan is talking to us about God's word, he uses lies and subtlety. When Satan is talking to God about our sin, he tells the truth. Because we have sinned. We have blown it. And Satan appeals to God's holiness and his righteousness to say, they screwed up. He's, a, he's tattletaling. Saying, God, they, they did something wrong. What are you going to do? You're holy. You can't just ignore it. So he appeals to truth. We have blown it. And in and of ourselves, we do deserve the, the just penalty for that sin. So what is our defense? Do we have a defense if we truly have blown it? Well, praise God, yes, we do. The Son of God, Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ do we have a defense to this. Zechariah 3, after uh, the attack that I had mentioned earlier, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Now Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And he responded and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again he said to him, See, I have taken your guilt away from you and will clothe you with festive robes. Now on the context, this is not directly written or applicable to us. This uh, involves a scene of Zechariah's vision, uh, again post-exilic, in which Satan is accusing Joshua the high priest, who is symbolically wearing Israel's sins as filthy rags. Satan is saying, how can you excuse your people Israel for the sins that they've committed? He's trying to get God to reject them on the basis of their sin. But in response to that accusation, God rebukes Satan and he acquits Joshua, who again is symbolically representative of Israel, by removing the filthy garments and instead clothing him with pure vestments on the basis of his gracious love and the choice of the nation of Israel. Not applicable to us, but I shared it to illustrate God's attitude towards Satan's accusations. If he has a response, 
in which he can say, you're accusing them on this basis, but on this basis, I acquit them, he will. And of us, it is true that if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hebrews 7.25 says of Jesus, Therefore, he is also able to save forever those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Colossians 1, And although you were previously alienated and hostile in attitude, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his body of flesh through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Only through Jesus Christ are we seen now by God as holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So whenever Satan accuses us, God is able to look at the person of Jesus and say in their alignment with him, they are holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That is the truth of what is happening on the heavenly scene. However, we still, at an emotional level, can be tripped up by this. But we don't have to be. As we remember, in my alignment with Christ, yes, I've sinned, I've blown it, but Christ has paid the penalty for my sin. We can effectively counter Satan's accusations by humbly confessing, which is to agree with God about our sin, and resting in the payment and intercession of Jesus. He is our high priest, interceding on our behalf. So here is our chart. You've got that filled out in your notes. From the Rolling Stones song, Sympathy of the Devil, I bring you the lyrics. <laughs> Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many a man's soul to waste. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't need to be puzzled by the nature of Satan's game. Through the word of God, we can know his strategy. And we can also know how we can defend ourselves against that strategy. Satan's purpose, his goal, is to get us to join him in opposing God's will. We can effectively counter Satan's strategy by instead aligning ourselves as firmly as possible with God's will. Let's close in a, in a word of prayer. God, thank you so much again for giving us your word, for giving us everything that we need for life and godliness. God, I ask that you would help us to go forth from here with a soberness concerning this present spiritual war, not overemphasizing it, but God, recognizing that we face a sophisticated and serious enemy that, that outclasses us, God, but that we, as we align with you, are operating from a standpoint of victory. Help us to continue to work out that balance as we grow. God, help us to know your word, to live in dependence upon your spirit, resting in the intercession of your son, and trusting that your plan is best. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.